uh, Western universities. I just, I just uh, follow your, 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 uh, your culture. I just call you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, that, no, that's absolutely fine. That's great. Please call me Philip. That's, uh, that's okay. perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Aubrey, I think you can uh, uh, start the opening. Uh, the time is just Aubrey. Okay. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Professor Philip. Good morning. Yes, in here it's afternoon already. Okay, yes, oh, yeah, is... good afternoon, I should say, really. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends and seniors. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the second of the public lecture series <laughs> between qualitative research design and method in accounting. My name is Aubrey Fiorentia, and today I will be your master of ceremony on this very special occasion. Also, it's an honor for me to have the opportunity to be in your presence this afternoon. First of all, I would like to welcome and thank Professor Philip Limsley as our speaker today, welcome. Professor Basuki PhD as our moderator, Erlangga. Professor Dr. Dian Agustia as Dean of the Economic and Business Faculty of Erlangga University, and to all of the audience today. Before we get into the main event, I'm going to give a brief explanation about our rundown today, which is this lecture will be divided into three sections. The first one is the opening by the moderator. The second one is the presentation by Professor Philip Linsley from University of York. And the last one is the Q&A session that will be led by our moderator. Now I'm going to read the rules for our lecture today. Please help with, okay. The public lecture is being recorded and live streamed, so please stay muted until you call upon and turn on your camera and use virtual background that has been shared by our crew. Then don't forget to rename your Zoom account in the format name underscore institution name. And the Q&A process will use Slido feature to ask question in chat. So please visit that website that already been given by our crew and enjoy your public lecture. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we will get into the main event of this, of the second lecture series that will be led by our moderator. Please welcome Professor Basuki. Okay, thank you, Aubrey. Um, again, uh, good morning for you, uh, Professor Philip Linsley from York University. Uh, on behalf of my uh, department or my faculty, I just uh, want to uh, say uh, thank you for your coming, welcoming you to this uh, special event of a public lecture. Uh, we have uh, the series of public lecture during uh, this semester. Um, excuse me, uh, Aubrey. Ada suara bocor, Aubrey. Oh, yes. Uh... To the audience, please stay muted until you call a phone so it doesn't disturb our public lecture today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adri. So I will continue. Um, again, uh, we are welcoming you, uh, Professor Linsley, uh, to this uh, our uh, public lecture series in our faculty. So uh, since the uh, Master of Ceremony already introduced you, so um, now you have time about uh, 40 minutes for your lecturing, and then will be followed by a uh, question and answer. Okay, uh, Philips, the time is yours. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a great, great pleasure to be with you all today. It is this morning in the UK, but I know it's afternoon for you, so good afternoon to everybody. Um, just before I start, uh, just to explain, I, I'm based at the University of York, where I'm a professor of accounting and risk. So uh, I'm very pleased to, to join uh, with your department and, uh, and, and to have a session where, um, yes, I will present, but then we can interact after that as well. So I'll share my screen uh, to begin the presentation.
but please do say if you can't see the screen or or if you can't hear me at any time uh, but but hopefully everything will work well uh, so so i was invited to talk about uh, qualitative research design in accounting uh, and, and I'll talk for just about 40 minutes, certainly no longer than that, so that you've got time for questions at the end. So I, I thought where I'd start was um, because uh, I was asked to talk about uh, accounting research. Um, I, I, I know as accountants, we're, we're very interested in annual reports and uh, understanding what companies disclose in their annual reports. Um, and it's, uh, it's not surprising, therefore, that uh, accounting academics, people like me, perhaps like yourselves, uh, we like to do disclosure studies uh, using some type of content analysis. Uh, and certainly when I started doing my research, the, the, this, the, this is what I uh, started doing. I started uh, by doing content analysis. Um, uh, and because my area is risk, I was interested in looking at what companies said about risk in their annual reports. Uh, but of course, you might research other areas in accounting. Uh, for example, um, an area like corporate social responsibility or sustainability it is an area that's often investigated by accounting academics and they will use content analysis when they look at annual reports or sometimes they'll look at environmental reports published by uh, companies. Uh, when, when I started doing this uh, type of research, then, uh, you know, it, it, it's a very good type of research approach. Um, and, and what I would do is get uh, lots of annual reports. And uh, with that sample of annual reports, I then look at all of the uh, risk disclosures. Um, and then I'd categorize those risk disclosures into the type of risk that it was uh, uh, being disclosed uh, and what was said about that risk. And of course, when we do content analysis, what, what we typically do is count sentences in the annual reports so that I could say there are perhaps 100 sentences about this type of risk and maybe there are 50 sentences about another type of risk. Uh, and that, that's useful information. We can find out things about what the companies are telling us about risk. Um, but where there is a difficulty is that we would often then say, well, we are equating the quantity of sentences that have been disclosed with quality. So if there are a lot of sentences about a particular type of risk, we tend to presume that that means that they are telling us useful information about that risk. And of course, that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes uh, you may only have a very few sentences about a particular risk, but, but it's very, very useful information. Uh, and, 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 and of course, we know that quantity does not always equal quality. Um, uh, as I tell my students, when they write essays or assignments, uh, they might write a very long essay. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a good essay. Sometimes a, a short essay will be better. So uh, when, I, when I started doing my research, I was happy to do this sort of content analysis uh, and I've published in this area. Uh, I, and I, I just felt that what it didn't tell me was something else about the risk disclosures. It didn't tell me uh, anything about how the companies talked about the disclosures. It didn't tell me about the, for example, type of language that they might use. 
So that's what made me think I, I need to do other types of research. Um, and, and content analysis obviously has a quantitative approach. Uh, and what I became interested in then uh, was doing research that was more qualitative. So uh, I started looking at qualitative research methods uh, that can be used in accounting research. Now, uh, of course, um, uh, accounting is, um, is my subject, uh, your subject too, uh, but most of the research methods that we use are research methods that other disciplines use as well. Uh, not just disciplines in business schools, um, but disciplines outside business schools across universities. So for example, interviews are very common as a qualitative research method. So I, I was wanting to talk to you about qualitative research methods used in accounting research. And I wanted to do it by, uh, I thought it'd be useful by doing it by reference to research that I've done to show you how I've taken methods that people use quite commonly, uh, but how I've then applied them to accounting research. So my research, uh, if I were to try to, to categorize it, uh, a lot of it anyway, is to do with very broadly what we might call accounting and culture. Uh, now, now, people look at culture in different ways. Uh, often they'll use, for example, um, frameworks developed by people like Hofstede um, and his uh, different dimensions of culture. Um, uh, I, I use a different, different framework. I, I'll mention that in just a minute. But, but I'm interested in uh, culture because it tells about people's behavior, how they think about things. Um, and of course, uh, because I'm particularly interested in uh, risk, um, I'm interested in how people think about risk and behave in terms of risk. Uh, some people, for example, are happy to take on a lot of risk. Other people don't like to take on a lot of risk. Um, and some of that can be to do with, with, with culture in, in the broadest sense. So I, I, I'm interested in accounting and culture. Uh, and I've, I've, I've looked at accounting and culture in different areas. So I've looked at, for example, audit failure, um, financialization, um, uh, the 2007-8 financial crisis, uh, accounting regulation, and then more specifically to do with risk. I've looked at it, uh, looked at risk disclosure using accounting and culture approaches and how, how banks uh, undertake risk management, what it is they do in the bank to, to manage risk. Uh, so uh, that's my, my research area uh, that is accounting and culture. Uh, now, I, I, I did a presentation a short while back um, uh, that I was invited to do uh, for your institution. Um, and I did explain that I, I use a particular framework for understanding culture. Now, don't worry if you, if you weren't at that presentation, and please don't worry about understanding this. Uh, but, but I just wanted to mention that what I, I do do is I, 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 um, I, I don't use frameworks like Hofstede for understanding um, people's culture. Um, I, I use a framework, it has this horrible name, Neo-Durkheimian Institutional Theory, but it, it's a framework that comes from social anthropology, and it's, it's a model for understanding the world and how people view the world. Uh, and you can see from the diagram uh, that what it work, what it ultimately does is it, it argues that we will have one of 
four different world views. So I might be either a fatalist or I might be a hierarchist or I might be an individualist or I might be an egalitarian. Uh, now, don't, don't worry too much about, about how, how we work out which of those we are, uh, but just be aware uh, for the presentation that this, this model um, categorizes people into four different worldviews. And what, what the model does is it says that if I am a hierarchist, I will see the world differently from the other three. All of them, all four of them see the world differently. Uh, and I will have, therefore, a different approach to how I think about risk, how I manage risk, how I think about strategy. Uh, really, I'll see the world differently in, in everything. Uh, how, how, I, how I operate at home and, um, uh, and, and, and how, how I organise my household will be differently, different. Um, it's, it, it affects everything that I do in terms of uh, interacting with the world and interacting with other people. So, so these four different world views operate in this, this theory. It was a theory developed by um, a lady called Mary Douglas, who was, as I say, um, a social anthropologist, uh, quite, quite a famous social anthropologist, uh, certainly in, in, in the world of anthropology anyway. Uh, so, so just so that you're aware that this is the framework that I use, uh, and it's you know, it's quite common in, in research, of course, that we will use theories um, and, and we will argue about which theory we think is, is the best theory to use. Um, uh, and some people might disagree with, with my use of this theory, which, of course, is, is, is fine. Um, I, I prefer this theory to, to theories like Hofstede, but, you know, I, I'm sure that Hofstede would disagree with me and say that uh, actually his theory is a better one to use, of course. <laughs> So uh, back, back to my research, um, I, I gave you a list of some of the areas where I have done research. And what I wanted to do is to show you, uh, first of all, a slide, how the research that I've done, uh, I've used different research approaches to it, uh, different research methods. So if you take uh, the work I've done on audit failure, and financialization and the, the financial crisis, uh, then the work that I did there, um, I, I suppose the way that I would categorize it, it was to do with interpreting um, quite broad historical events. So looking back at big historical events and trying to understand those by uh, in all of these cases, uh, I used that theory that I mentioned just before. So uh, understanding it was a particular case of audit failure, uh, understanding financialization, understanding the financial crisis, using that theory as a framework. Uh, and I'll, 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 I'll talk a little bit, bit about that in just a, a few minutes. Um, I said that I also had done research on accounting regulation um, and the accounting regulation research used the same theory, uh, but I, I suppose I would categorize that as document analysis that I used, uh, using a, a particular approach uh, uh, of coding documents in a particular way, and I'll, I'll briefly explain that to you. Um, the, the risk or one of the examples of risk disclosure research that I'll talk to you about um, is really uh, archival research. Um, so following um, the approach of historians, uh, historians will often go to archives uh, to find old documents uh, and, and then they will uh, 
closely read and review those documents. Uh, and that's what I've done certainly for, for one of my uh, pieces of risk disclosure research. So, so I'll talk about that. Uh, and then the fourth one there is the, um, the interviews, um, which I've used to examine uh, how banks manage risk. Now, for all of these, you could use different research approaches, of course, uh, but th these are some of the qualitative research approaches that I have used. Uh, I'll take you briefly through these just so that you can see what I mean by them. Uh, and then I'll mention at the end the fact that there are other qualitative research approaches that, that, that we could decide to use as well. Uh, but I'll start uh, at the top. Um, oh, no, I'm not starting at the top. I'm starting in the middle with document analysis uh, and accounting regulation. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about this one first. Uh, I, I, obviously, as an accountant, I, I'm quite interested in accounting regulation. How, how the, the regulator operates is important. Um, in the United Kingdom, uh, and so, well, certainly at the time when I was doing this research that was uh, uh, published in 2016, uh, the Financial Reporting Council regulated accounting and auditing in the UK. Uh, the, the Financial Reporting Council in the UK has been under a lot of criticism lately um, and, and changes happening uh, to it. Uh, but at the time of the research, it was the regulator. Uh, and of course, that's a, a very important job being the regulator. Um, the government, uh, the public uh, assume that the regulator will be doing a good job. Uh, they assume that the regulator will be ensuring that uh, the accounting firms are setting uh, appropriate accounting standards, um, the Financial Re Reporting Council uh, is responsible for the Corporate Governance Code in the UK as well. So, so they, they have a big responsibility to ensure that um, uh, out accounting and auditing is, is taking place appropriately. Um, now, of course, uh, because the world keeps changing, uh, accounting regulation, auditing standards, corporate governance codes, all have to change to reflect what is happening in the world uh, and to stay up to date. And for uh, this Financial Reporting Council body, whenever um, they are reviewing codes or standards, or if they're setting up a new code or standard, then they have a public consultation. So they, they will draft a document um, that discusses the new code that they think might be relevant, uh, but then they'll have a consultation uh, to which anyone can respond and you can write back to them and say what you think about the new code, whether you think it's good, whether you think it needs to be changed in a different way, whether you think they've forgotten something. Um, so so it's, a, it's a public consultation that goes on. Now, that's really important to have the public consultation um, because the Financial Reporting Council um, it's meant to listen to all different types of views. It shouldn't just listen to business people. It shouldn't just listen to accounting firms. It should listen to a whole range of organizations and individuals. You know, I could write in in the public consultation to give my view. Uh, and what they should do is listen to all of those views and, and, and then work with those different views uh, to come up with a good standard or a, a good new code. Uh, and that means that if they do that, then regulation is being reformed in an appropriate manner. 
Now, certainly in the UK, um, because there have been lots of criticisms of the regulator and what they do, um, this was a, a motivation for doing this research uh, to understand whether the regulator, when it went out and did these public consultations, was it really listening to people? And was it taking into account the views of these different people? So that's what this research was about, to understand whether they did listen to this, uh, to, to the people who, who responded to the public consultation. Uh, so as I say, the, these responses to the, the consultations can be from anyone. Um, and they, they are put on the, uh, the website of the Financial Reporting Council, which for researchers is very good because it means I can go to the website, I can access all of those um, responses that everybody has sent in. Uh, I don't have to pay for them. I don't have to ask any permissions to do it. Um, when people respond, they know they're going to be public documents. Um, and so what I was able to do, uh, and I did this in two different uh, research papers, was uh, I looked at particular consultations that the regulator had, and I downloaded all of the responses and I did an analysis of those responses. So I was analysing those documents and those responses for, were from, some were from accounting firms, sometimes the big accounting firms like PwC, sometimes from smaller accounting firms, some were from professional accounting bodies, some were from individuals, some were from interest groups, uh, you know, people like shareholder type organisations. So you had all of this range of, of responses. Um, and what, what I was doing was looking at each response uh, and carefully reviewing each response and then trying to work out whether the response indicated that person was individualist, hierarchist, enclave is the same as fatalist, an isolate, uh, sorry, enclave is the same as egalitarian, an isolate is fatalist. So, so those are the four um, worldviews from the theory. Um, and I was working through all of the responses and I was looking for particular concepts. So you can see that for an individualist, I was looking for concepts related to, for example, individual freedom or entrepreneurialism uh, and, and coding the responses when I found those concepts. Uh, so I could then determine, well, for this response, mostly the concepts that are within this response are either individualist or they are hierarchist. So I could work out uh, or try to work out um, whether the respondent uh, had a particular worldview. So which of the, the four worldviews it belonged to. Now, I didn't do this alone. Uh, a, a colleague, a second researcher did this too. In, uh, and we did it separately because of course, when you're doing this, um, it, it's not a science, um, it's an art. So we could then compare whether we were getting the same world views or not. And when we were getting disagreements, then we had to work out why we were getting disagreements. So, so we're doing that type of document analysis based on using concepts for the four world views. Uh, and the, the conclusion that we drew from this was that um, the Financial Reporting Council, when we looked at its documents, it is individualist. And when it did its consultation and then brought out the final version of the new standard or the new code, um, what it was doing was it was only listening and and, and taking account of the responses from the individualistic 
people. So if I was hierarchist and I provided a response, they were not really taking account of what I said. And therefore, it was a way of working out then and concluding that the Financial Reporting Council was not really doing a good job because it was not listening to everybody. And therefore, the, uh, the, 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 the work that it was doing uh, was such that it was only listening to one group of people. So that's a form of document analysis that I've used. Uh, uh, and, and of course, you can use documents in different ways. I could code, you know, environmental reports in the same way, for example, and work out, are they one of the four worldviews? So uh, a, a second area where I've done qualitative research is interpreting historical events. Uh, and, and again, I've used the theory where I'm trying to work out from historical events, uh, world views, as it were. Uh, but this is, uh, rather than looking at documents, that the, I've talked about this as interpretation of historical events, because I'm often looking at a very broad historical sweep of events. Uh, for example, um, in respect of audit failure, uh, what I wanted to do was to understand the Enron audit failure, which um, happened quite a long time ago now. And I suppose that shows I must be getting older, but that's, you know, that's life, isn't it? Um, this happened in 2001. Uh, it's something that I, I don't know whether you, you teach this case or not. Uh, uh, Quite often in, certainly I know in UK universities, it's still used as a case because it was such a, a big audit failure um, with, with Arthur Anderson, the auditor, <clears throat> being such a, a large audit uh, auditor. Um, it, it was a, a key case that changed a lot of things in terms of audit. <clears throat> Uh, and I, I was interested in this, uh, so I'd seen some other papers that had looked at Enron, and they'd used other theories, like um, theories from sociology. There's a, a sociologist, Anthony Giddens. <clears throat> but I, I was not convinced that they uh, fully interpreted the event, or certainly not in the way that I thought it could be interpreted. Uh, so what I was examining was the auditor, Arthur Anderson, uh, and I was examining the culture or, or the world view of Arthur Anderson. And you can see this is over quite a broad period. I was examining how it had changed its world view from the 1960s through to the 2000s. So, so I was really looking at a 40 year period um, so, so it's a very broad interpretation of how the firm had changed. So I was using uh, uh, a lot of uh, information that was available about Arthur Anderson and how Arthur Anderson operated and how it had changed over that period. Um, and the argument that I presented in the paper was that Arthur Anderson had changed from being a hierarchist firm to an individualistic firm. And that change had happened during more or less the 1980s. So it had started off being a hierarchical firm uh, and hierarchical firms operate different to individualistic firms. Um, and it was based on this that I then said, because it had, uh, it had changed, this change to individualistic had had impacts on the worldview of the audit firm. For example, it was more motivated by profit in the audit firm than it was motivated by adhering to high professional standards. 
Uh, so using the concepts in the theory, uh, I was explaining why they had started uh, to change the way they approached audit. So that was a very broad 40 year period that I was looking at, interpreting what was happening at Arthur Anderson. Again, using this idea of, well, what concepts apply for the four different world views, and then arguing, well, before the 1980s, it was hierarchical, after it was individualistic. Uh, and I, I did a similar thing with financialization too. Um, I, I don't know whether you've uh, studied any, any financialization literature. Um, financialization is this idea that um, in different parts of the world, um, uh, organizations um, and companies and banks and uh, perhaps governments even, um, have become very much more focused on things that are financial. Um, so, for example, companies are have become so focused, for example, on shareholder value. Uh, whereas before they might have been a, had a broader focus on a wider range of stakeholders. Um, and, and what I was interested in was understanding why if you take two different countries and the countries I took were the UK, uh, because I know the UK well, of course, uh, and Germany, uh, which I knew something about and one of my co-authors is German, um, uh, if you looked at financialization processes in the two countries, they're different. Uh, for example, companies in the UK uh, have changed over the years to have a much greater focus on shareholder value than companies in Germany. Uh, so since the roughly the, the 1980s, 1990s, that's happened. Uh, and what I wanted to understand is, well, why is it different in the UK to Germany? Why in the UK is there this greater focus on shareholder value? Both countries seem to be quite similar in many ways, both European countries, um, you know, both with relatively strong economies. So I was looking at a here a very long period. Uh, I looked at the period 1945 to 2015. Uh, and so I was looking at the two countries over that, that period and saying, what, what has happened in those countries? At a, at a very high level, not to do with necessarily accounting, uh, not necessarily to do with even e economics, but what's happened in other, other parts of uh, the country in terms of how they see the world and, uh, and what, what do they think about things and how have they changed. Um, and what, what I argued was that the, the difference is that over the period uh, of 60 or 70 years, the UK changed from hierarchy to individualistic, whereas Germany changed from hierarchy, so they both started as hierarchy, but it actually changed to a hybrid of three things, hierarchy, individualist, individualistic, and egalitarian. So uh, it was because of this, I argued, that you therefore get different types of financialization. So as I say, this was all at a, a very broad level. A lot of what I was looking at was really what was happening at a political level in the country to interpret the historical events and work out the overall worldview of the two countries. 
Uh, and of course, somebody might argue that I've got that wrong, uh, that I've misinterpreted it, because that is such a broad sweep that I'm looking at. Uh, the next area is archival research. Uh, and in that archival research, uh, it was to do with risk disclosure. Um, and I mentioned at the beginning that this research is, it really comes from, uh, I suppose, the history discipline originally. Uh, and what I was doing was I, I was working with uh, two colleagues who, do focus on accounting history. That's what they're interested in. Uh, so what they uh, spend a lot of their time doing is going to archives. Uh, so they go to um, particular places where old documents are stored uh, and they get those old documents out and they, they read through them. Um, and uh, what we wanted to do was look at a particular um, risk event, which was to do with this company, the Burma Oil Company. Uh, and you can see it's, a, it, it's going back in time, hence to do with history. Uh, and we were looking at a particular five year period from 1971 to 1976. Uh, and the reason that we were looking at that period was because in the middle of that period in 1974, um, the company had a crisis to do with its oil tanker fleet. Uh, and the crisis was so severe that the UK government had to financially support the company to help it survive. So what we did as researchers, or my two colleagues did this, was um, visited the archive for the Burma Oil Company. Uh, so they went down to, um, I think it was in London, um, and they looked at the documents to do with Burma Oil Company. Uh, and they looked at all sorts of documents some of them were um, documents from that period, 1971 to 1976, that were to do with uh, human resource policies in the company. Uh, some of them were uh, the uh, record of board meetings. Uh, some of them were letters that they had sent to the gov UK government and letters that they'd received from the UK government. Uh, and of course, the other thing that we looked at were the annual reports from the archive for that period. Uh, so again, we were reviewing those uh, and looking for how they fitted with the four different concepts. Um, those concepts uh, you can see here on the slides talking about identifying patterns of social relations. That, that's how this um, theory operates because it's a social anthropology. It's to do with social relations between people. Um, and we were looking at the historical documents. Um, and what we were looking at were documents that told us uh, when we used the theory that the firm over the period had changed from hierarchical to fatalist. Uh, and because it had changed from hierarchical to fatalist, what we also looked at was how they managed risk before and after the crisis. Uh, and what we were able to observe was before the crisis, they managed it in one particular way that was as for the hierarchy, and then they managed it in a different way afterwards because they were fatalist. And in the annual report, the disclosures, the risk disclosures also changed to reflect the fact the company had changed its world view. Um, just to show you briefly, so that the sorts of things we were looking at 
and and the quotes that we put in, for example, uh, the research paper um, in the period before the crisis, um, when we were talking about the company being hierarchical, then we we found quotes, for example, about um, the company talked about good men serving the group's interests best, uh, and about people having to be very loyal to the company. And if they were loyal, then they would be promoted. Um, and that's a very hierarchical way of operating. You expect people to be loyalty, loyal. You expect people to look after uh, not their own individual interests, but the interests of the group. So that's how we were identifying whether it was hierarchical or, or, or some of something else, one of the other three. Uh, and then afterwards, we we're looking to see, was it still hierarchical? Uh, but in fact, it had moved to isolate or, or fatalist is the other word for this. Um, and why it had changed. And again, it was looking at the historical documents. Uh, so, so from that, you can see that a lot of what I'm doing is interpreting different things, whether it's historical documents or responses from the Financial Reporting Council consultations, um, or, or what is in annual reports. I'm interpreting them according to the theory. And that's the same thing that I did with the interviews, um, looking at banking um, and how people had managed risk in the banks. Um, and this was where I conducted interviews in London with employees at very large investment banks. So these are banks that are doing a, uh, doing a lot of trading on the financial markets, for example. Um, and so we had a number of interviewees um, who gave up an hour of their time. And then again, I was analysing these through this particular theory, neo-Durkheimian institutional theory. Um, and here what you can see are, these are, I, I just wanted to give you uh, uh, an example of some quotes that we looked at um, in the interviews. We went, we, we did as you would normally do with interviews. We, we recorded them. Uh, and then the recordings were listened to and we typed them all up so that we had them as a transcript for each interviewee. Um, and then we could go through the transcript looking at exactly what they had said and uh, looking at whether they were individualist, fatalist or whatever. And here's some examples of some who were fatalist. There were other other worldviews as well, um, but these are people who say that they they feel that they are just part of a machine. Uh, they don't feel that anyone really is interested in them in a bank. They're just part of a machine. So the sorts of phrases they use are here. I am a cog in the machine. I am a nameless person in a suit. I am just a commodity of the bank. I'm just like a, a computer or a window or any other piece of furniture. Uh, so, so we're doing, again, this interpretation. Um, and again, you can see it's not a, a science. It's, it's my interpretation uh, of how, how they are viewing the world by using the theory and the concepts in the theory. Um, but uh, th those are just things that I have used, uh, but I could do my research in other ways as well. My, if I was doing qualitative research, um, if, if I wanted to for the banks rather than interviews, I might have run focus groups. So rather than meeting with each person individually, uh, I could have asked, would they be willing to meet in a small group of four or five people together? Um, and I, I might do that. You know, in research, you know, I've given an example of research that I could do with this, which is, you know, I might do it to understand how companies manage 
uh, emerging or new risks. Um, and focus groups operate slightly differently to interviews because the people talk to one another. Uh, sometimes you get different information uh, than you would from an interview. I might use linguistic analysis, some sort of linguistic analysis. There are lots of different types. But if I want to understand how companies talk about risk in their annual reports, that, that's something I might do. I might look at the tone that they use or the particular way they, they use language. Or I might do ethnographic studies uh, to understand how auditors act whilst auditing clients. So I might go in to watch the auditors as they work. Um, that's always difficult because people don't, they're not always that keen that you do it. Uh, also, it takes a lot, long time. Uh, and I'm sure you're like me, um, academic life is very busy uh, and trying to find time to do ethnographic studies uh, where you observe over long periods in person in the company situation, it's very, very difficult. Um, but I just want to give you some ideas of, of other areas where you can do qualitative research as well. Uh, so I think it, I should stop there, really. I hope that's been interesting. Um, uh, and, and I'm very happy to answer any, any questions that you might have. OK, uh, thanks, uh, Philips. OK, the audience. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, I forgot to inform you that uh, the audience, uh, uh, some of the, our audience today is um, our a, a professor or lecturer in our department. And then the student uh, <laughs> range from uh, undergraduate to a doctoral degree uh, attends uh, in your lecturing uh, this morning. Okay. Um, it's, I think it's very interesting topic, Philip, that uh, uh, your uh, presentation today that we are talking a lot of things uh but sometimes that's a uh, okay before i go to uh, the question and answer i just want to uh say that uh, some of our students just worried when they are using a qualitative uh, re uh, research they're worried about uh, the publishing in the you know that sometimes the uh, the journal the good reputation journal just reject because of a qualitative rather than uh, using a quantitative uh, method uh, do you know what I mean? That's the, I the, 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 what the, the, our students just worried about that. So just moving again from, uh, call it, uh, say, uh, they start to study qualitative research and because of the difficulties to publish their work and then they change to uh, come back to qualitative uh, research. I think that's, uh, that's our problem here in our, in our faculty. Okay, then. Uh, uh, I want. Uh, I will see that uh, a question here. I got the first from uh, Agung. Agung is one of our uh, young lecturer, but also he is uh, taking uh, uh, a doctoral degree now. Uh, his question is: In historical research, researcher can be analyzed, documented. So, what is the main difference? in historical and document analysis? That's the question number one. Mm -hmm. And the question number two, while document analysis, we are also doing interviewing with the document as a data and coding them. Can we decide this method as library study? Okay, that's a question from Akung. Okay. So uh, forgive me if I forget the questions and I have to ask them again. But okay. the, first, the first part of the question was um, about document analysis and historical analysis. That's right, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, they, they, I, I, they, they obviously merge into one another. Uh, so in, in a sense, my talking about them separately is um, slightly... Uh, it's not misleading, but it, it is. Um, uh, it is just to, I suppose, to emphasise that the the studies were looking at different things. Um, I, I suppose what I wanted to emphasise was that if you take, for example, the financialization research, um, that that was, uh, which I said was, you know, a, a historical study uh, or historical interpretation, that it was just such a broad. Uh, period of time that I was looking at, 
Um, uh, and it was uh, so broad that it, you know, it was over 60 or 70 years. Whereas the document analysis, I, I was just trying to emphasize, I was looking at a specific set of documents that I, I wanted to focus on, which were the responses to the consultation. Uh, so, so really they, they do start to merge together. Um, and, and to talk about them separately is, is a bit, um, uh, uh, is slightly false in some ways. It's a bit like, you know, if I, if I do annual report-based research, you know, you could argue that if I'm looking at annual reports over the last 10 years, well, that, that's to do with history, isn't it? Um, so in a, in a way, that's historical research. Anything to do with the past is history. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, uh, you know, I don't worry about categorising them into one or the other, really. Uh, I, I'm more worried, a bit like you said at the beginning, about uh, where might I publish the research? That's because right. that, because that, 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 that can sometimes be um, uh, problematical uh, and, and uh, thinking wh where to get published is important. Um, th there, are s there are a number of good journals um, that will publish qualitative research, there's accounting research. Um, the, the, they're the ones that I tend to concentrate on, like critical perspectives on accounting or accounting auditing and uh, you know, triple yeah. AJ. So, so you, that that's that is something that I I I think about uh, to some extent where I will publish. Um, now, the the other question was to do with uh, I think if I remember rightly about the documents uh, doing Document some documents and, and, and then supplementing it with interviews. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, certainly, yes. Uh, it, it is. Um, uh, something that you uh, can very usefully do because uh, w when you're looking at documents, uh, you first of all are doing your interpretation uh, and you don't know whether you've done the interpretation correctly. So to then do interviews is a way of understanding that. For example, I've got a, a PhD student who uh, is looking at to do things to do with sustainability. So they're looking at annual reports and trying to understand uh, what, what theory might apply to these uh, disclosures. Um, uh, and what they've done is then actually gone to the companies that they've used as a sample and they have interviewed managers in the company to ask them, what were you thinking when you disclosed this information? Why did you choose to, to disclose this type of information? Um, you could have disclosed other types of information to do with sustainability. Um, okay. And I think that's a really good thing to do because um, uh, I, I'm very aware when I just look at documents, it is my interpretation, um, but you can supplement that with interviews and be better uh, placed to understand whether your interpretation is the correct yeah. interpretation. Yeah. So I, I really like that idea. I think it's a great thing to do. Yeah. It takes more time, of course. Oh, and yeah, effort. Yeah, of course. yeah, it's harder work. You're analysing the documents, then you're analysing interview transcripts. Yeah. But you might have very good data that you can publish, yeah. not just you know, one paper, you might get two papers from it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think something like uh, you triangulate your uh, document with interview, something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. I think, yeah, yeah. Uh, the main, uh, the, the question of the uh, of uh, uh, Agung question is, can we decide it, this method as library study? You know, that's uh, sometimes we know about uh, the library study or library research. Is that, is that similar with uh, what you are doing? If, if um. If I were doing interviews as well as document analysis, I, I guess I wouldn't classify it as li library research personally. Um, you know, the fact that you've done interviews and gone into the, you know, you've gone out into the uh, the field to do the, the interviews. Um, you know, I guess you could count, you know, 
if you look at my study of accounting regulation, would I call that a library-based study? Not all that. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, yeah. Maybe, yes, yeah, it just might be like that. Okay. So, certainly what it means is that I, you know, I don't need to leave leave my office or my, my home. Um, yeah. I, I can do that, you know, purely based at home um, or in the office. Uh, and, and that's advantageous, of course. Okay, then. Um, uh, the next question, uh, unfortunately, there is no name here, but uh, uh, he, he, he writes here that some argue that qualitative research is weak since the researcher is a main instrument, while quantitative research use, for example, validated instruments. So what's uh, your reckon about this uh, statement? That's a qualitative is weaker uh, than a quantitative because you know that's uh, in a quantitative uh, sometimes must be measured using uh, very very sophisticated statistical and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> so what what's your reckon? I, I, this is that's a really interesting question, isn't it? Um, uh, well, one reason that that that, that make, makes me smile is um, uh, uh, I, I've got a brother who's. Uh, trained uh, uh, as a, an economist, so he's you yeah. know his PhD is is in economics, and uh, he 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 always says to me, uh, you know, economists when they look at accountants doing uh, quantitative research, they shake mm -hmm. their head and say, you're doing it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yeah. science, is it right? Right. Says, you know, yeah, economists will say this, this, this is the right way to do it uh, um, and, and uh, what you do as accounting research that's quantitative is it, you know it's not not quite right uh, but then he does also say that when he speaks to uh, mathematicians they tell him you're an economist you're not really doing your statistics correctly you know so, so, so there's a, a hierarchy isn't there in some ways even with quantitative research that's right. yeah, that's um, right. now uh, quantitative or qualitative better I, I i know that some people will argue one is better than the other um, right. and, and of course you know th they will tend to argue that what is better is the type of research that they yeah, do. Yeah. That, that's that's natural, isn't it? But but I I I think we need both of them. They they look at different things and they do it in different ways. Now, yes, you might argue that if I'm doing my qualitative research, I'm doing all of this interpretation. I'm saying I will interpret what somebody has said in an interview and and I may have got that wrong. And of course I may have. Um, uh, it, it's my interpretation. I, I try to reduce some of that perhaps because I might do the research with another colleague and individually we'll look at the interviews and then we'll compare our results. And if, yeah. if our results are very different, we'll say, well, uh, perhaps we're not interpreting, interpreting this correctly. What, what, what are we doing here? Um, now, of course, when you do quantitative research, you know, looking for, um, you know, looking for associations between variables and you do different types of regression analysis, for example, <clears throat> you know, that, 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 that's good. It's good to do it. But you, you're then you're still making assumptions about the world and still, um, you know, trying to tie things together. And you might get significant results so that you get positive, you know, positive results. There seems to be an association. You don't know if that is a true association still. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you, you look to see that, um, you know, people do risk disclosure work in this way. So they count up numbers of risk sentences and then they look at different variables. You know, they look at the board members and say, have they got a risk? qualification perhaps and they say oh look the companies where board members have a risk qualification give higher numbers of risk disclosures that's and that's the reason why they give higher numbers of risk disclosures is it really i'm not sure that it is i might argue you know is it yeah. is it 
is that really what? So, so we're doing different things. It's not that one is better or worse, and, and both have have things that are imperfect about them. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Maybe something like uh, what you said that uh, uh, your research is some say some measures quality of disclosure by counting certain of risk. So people can argue what kind of risk is that because you know that uh, the views uh, the people views may be different from one to the other. Something like that. Okay, yeah. friends. Uh, the next question is uh, how to convince the company that the research in a way will benefit the company. So they will open access their data archive or meeting records. It means that's how to confirm when you when you do this by this one, how to confirm yeah. them that they can open to us. Yeah, it, I, th this is a it's it's really difficult, isn't it? This idea of yeah. company access because uh, it, it it's not just that they are busy um uh, I, I think more importantly is they I, I think they worry a bit about the information that they are potentially giving to you yeah. um because it, often you want to ask them questions that are uh, uh well for us researchers they're interesting questions but they they can be to the interviewee, uh, sensitive questions. That's right, that's right. Uh, for example, when I was interviewing the bankers, uh, then they were concerned that what I wanted to do was be critical of banking. S certainly in the United Kingdom, people are quite critical of bankers. They think they get too much pay um, and they don't uh, think about their actions. Uh, so they're very, they can be very suspicious of what you are wanting to do. Um, the, 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 the way that I've usually got access is by starting off knowing somebody in, Oh, the company. I, exactly. um, I, I suppose that's been the or oh, that's the easiest way I've found. Yeah. So I've known somebody and I've talked to them and said, this is, you know, I, I, I've, I've said, can I tell you about the research project and what we're trying to do? And then told them about all of the um, confidentiality that goes around it. That's and right. Uh, try to explain about how we anonymize not just the interviewees but make the company anonymous, anonymous. as much as possible. Yeah. Now, now that doesn't always work because sometimes they still say, "Well, I have to talk to, you know, my manager, and my, my manager, manager won't boss. let me do so." Um, yeah. uh, and sometimes you start off thinking they're going to give you access, and then they say at a later date, "I'm sorry, no." Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I found that is the way um, that, that I have got access. Just trying to contact people, I think, is very, very difficult. Yeah. So if I haven't known somebody, I suppose what I then try to do is find somebody who I, you know, a friend or a colleague to say, do you know somebody in this industry or this company? I would like to... Um, you know, do this research. Do you think you can give me yeah, a yeah, yeah. one one contact? If if I can get one contact, then that that will start things. What what is interesting though is if you can get that the the, the contact and the agreement. Usually, when people start the interview, they, they may be a little bit suspicious, but but often after five or ten minutes. Um, if you're doing, uh, you know, being careful with your interview, um, often then they start to tell you a lot of things uh, and become very open. Uh, and yeah. they start to tell you things that you think, you know, I'm really surprised you're telling me this. Uh, like the bankers' interviews, they would tell us things like, do you know, we lost a lot of money 
because yeah. we did this. And you think, yeah. I'm yeah. Really surprised you told me that. But it's because it's almost as if they, when you've got their trust, it's a bit like they're talking to their doctor and they, we, they, they want to, 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 to have somebody who they, they can confidentially unburden themselves to. That's right. um, and, and, and it's why whenever I do interviews, although I'll say I just need 45 minutes of your time, I always make sure that I, I don't have an interview straight after because you get some people after 45 minutes say, can I tell you some more? And the interview okay. might last two hours because of that. Yeah. Um, and you don't want to stop an interview if somebody's telling you a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah of <laughs> keep going, keep going. <laughs> keep going, keep going, deep and deep yeah. and deep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think I think that's similar with in, 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 in Indonesia as well, that sometimes we, we have a difficulty to convince people, you know, that uh, yeah. maybe some data is uh, uh, very confidential. Uh, even when we say that this is for the academic manner, or for academic purposes. Uh, yeah. Sometimes uh, they are refused to, to do that. So I think the the, the important thing, as uh, as you said, that we have uh, we have to have uh, uh, the key person. Is that right? The key person yes. that we can open or can give the access to us to uh, to give the data. Okay, that's yeah. It. Thank you, uh, Philips. And the next uh, question. This is still uh, some questions. Uh, okay, uh, hang on, uh, Aubrey. Uh, what time we have uh, left? For this, or we still have to finish this? I think I have to. Uh, we have to finish all the question, okay? Because it's very interesting topic, and uh, okay, then, okay. Uh, uh, the question from uh, we we uh, maybe this is our our college here. Uh, the question is: uh, Should qualitative research reveal the novelty of the research being carried out? What are the obstacles in the data collection and how to overcome them? So he's talking about novelty and then the obstacle and the how to overcome the obstacle. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, the, I suppose the obstacles um, can, can partly depend on the type of data collection that you are doing. Uh, I... I I think I don't. I think I think people do research in different ways, um, and I, I say I, I wanted to say that because I, I don't know that I, the way that I do research. I'm not sure whether it, this is the best way to do it, but it's the way that I do it. Um, I, I do research into areas that 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 are interesting to me. Um, and I look at things and think, oh, that would be interesting to look at. Uh, you know, it's one of the very great privileges of being an academic that you're able to, to research areas that, that you want to. And certainly at York University, they, they, you know, nobody tells me at York University, Philip, because you're an accountant, you must do research in this area or this way. Um, so so I, I can go whichever direction I want. Um, now, now I, I mentioned that because then, you know, I start to look at things and I think, oh, you know, for example, accounting regulation. I, I just notice perhaps one day that, that, that you get all these public consultations and these response letters. And I think it'd be interesting to look at those. And I just download some. And I think, you know, uh, I, I wonder what I could do with these because you've got all of this nice data um, that, that's available. Uh, I don't have the problem of finding interviewees because it's it's there in the public um, domain. Um, uh, so I, I sort of think I, I, I could do something with this. Um, uh, and I, so, so I don't start off with a, a, a very clear research plan as to what I'm doing. Um, and, and it probably makes it a bit, 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 bit awkward when colleagues work with me because I, I think some colleagues think we should be saying we're going to do this step, this step, this step. And I'm saying, but I just need to read these and just think about them. And then I need to write, do some writing about them and then I'll think about them. And, and I suppose that's the way, I, you know, in terms of obstacles, that's when I find out what the obstacles are. Um, 
because there there are so many different obstacles that you find. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes it's when you look at the data, you think, I, I, I just don't know that there's enough data to write something sufficiently that 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 it would get published. So I, I just think, you know. I, I, you know, I might have spent a week reading the data and doing some writing, but I, I, I don't throw that away. I just put it in a, you know, in a drawer because uh, I might come back to it because I might suddenly have an idea. Oh, well, I can get this extra data or, or I can do some uh, do something with it in a different way. Um, uh, but, but yes, I, I, I sort of work in that way and. The obstacles I come up against, um, I, I guess, uh, I, I just sort of, I don't know, I can't can't really give it a, a, a sort of a, a clear thematic analysis of them. I, I just sort of, um, I, I sort of get the data and think about it and then think about what I'll do with it and ways, if I, if I, I sometimes think, you know, I'll use the theory that I, I've talked about, or sometimes think oh, I might use an alternative theory in this way, because this actually seems to fit more with this theory. Um, I, I, and I, that's not a very good answer, is it really? It's just, you see, I, I just sort of work in that partic particular way. Um, I better stop there, because I, I think I'm just sort of, um, uh, not 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 being very clear about quite quite what I do. Uh, I think so. One more uh, one one thing that uh, you, uh, you you have an answer is that uh, should uh, qualitative research reveal the novelty of the research being carried out? You um, must or must not reveal the novelty in qualitative. That's the. Uh, um, so I, I'm not sure whether I quite understand the question. Uh, in, in terms of any any research, it, the, there needs to be some some s something novel about it. Um, but but to what extent things need to be novel? I think that, uh, you know, it's a bit like doing PhDs. You, you, you want to make a contribution. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. But, but it doesn't have to be, you know, com so completely new that nobody's ever thought about this before. It's just trying to give some alternative insights into understanding something. Uh, so, so uh, you know, I guess that's where when I talk just a minute or two about, about how I do things. Uh, the main thing that I'm doing when I'm initially looking at data and thinking, can I, can I make some research out of this? I'm thinking, is there something new that I have to say? And I, I, the other thing that I do think is, will people say, oh, that's quite interesting? Yeah, now, yeah. you might read my research and say, Philip, I don't think it's that interesting, but at least at least I've got to think I, 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 that it might be interesting yeah. so that people go, do you know, I had not thought about that in that way, uh, or I hadn't thought about, you know, that you could understand that data by, by analysing it, it in that way. So, so there has to be some something knew about it, but it doesn't have to be that you're making huge leaps forward always. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because uh, that's a kind of question is uh, the question that's always being asked by X minor for our PhD student especially. What is mm -hmm. your novelty in your uh, dissertation? That's the, so that's why they're always being asked that. Okay, I think now is the last question because uh, we have a, a limited time is that, uh, uh, is talking about linguistic analysis is part of hermeneutic as methodology. And then what is the difference uh, between the two? Well, I don't think I'm really very qualified to answer that. I, I've only ever done a little bit of uh, what you might call linguistic analysis, um, where I, I did a 
piece of research looking at um, uh, really it was looking at the uh, the tone of the language, um, uh, because, uh, you know, sometimes people, for example, sometimes people will talk, for example, very confidently, won't they? Oh, I see. Um, uh, it's that sort of idea of the, the tone of the language. You know, sometimes people will talk very confidently. Some people will talk so confidently as if they know everything, for example, uh, whereas other people will talk... Uh, they might say the same thing, um, but they will not be as confident. Um, and, and I did use a piece of software that um, was available to understand the tone of the, um, the discussions. Uh, however, that's really the only linguistic analysis I analysis that I've done and I you know uh, so I've not not done any any in any depth I I, I do think it's I, I do like the idea of linguistic analysis though because it, sometimes it's how we say things matters doesn't it no. um, well you know you, you can see this for example well I can certainly see it you know we've had this terrible pandemic for the last 18 months and you know the, how how do you know uh, how does for example the UK government talk to UK citizens about the the covid pandemic and how do the scientists talk to the citizens about the risks to do with it that that, that tells you that language and the way we use language matters um, uh, and, and so I, 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 you know, I think language matters greatly. Uh, it's just that I've not not done a lot of linguistic analysis. Uh, you know, I, I know there are lots of different ways of doing it. Sometimes people use linguistic analysis in terms of what what stories are being told. So there's a, a, a storytelling aspect, but but it's not something I, I know a lot about. But I do think it's really important to do research in that area because it matters greatly. Okay, so uh, I think the, the difference is that and when and we are using linguistic is about tone, how how to express the tone, while in uh, hermeneutic is talking about the substance of the topic. Yeah, that, I guess. Uh, is that yeah. really, yeah, clearly lost. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think. That, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, as I say, I, I, you know, if somebody's doing some research using some sort of linguistic analysis, I... Yeah. You know, I, I think that's great that they're doing it because it, it is so important. Okay, then. So, uh, hang on, hang on. I think I think we have. Uh, we will stop at five forty five here. So I, it means that ten forty five, uh, ten fifty five in the UK. Okay, I think, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Philip Lindsley, uh, that you have bring uh, some, somehow you bring some new, what we call it, uh, new knowledge for us. So for, for example, something like, um, uh, what you call it, uh, institutional theory, uh, neo Duckham institutional theory. Okay, is that uh, Emil Duckham? Duckham, yeah. how to pronounce it? it? Yes, it is. It's it, it it's uh, it's uh, Mary Douglas took some of the ideas of Emile Durkheim and from Emile Durkheim, and, okay. and, and uh, she's uh, then developed some of those ideas into her own theory. So okay, that's okay. why you're quite correct. That's where the the name comes from. Pe from people have called the theory different things, though. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it keeps changing its name. Yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting because by using this theory, we will map the, the people views from the four uh, categories or uh, hierarchies mm -hmm. and fatalists and so on and so on. So I yeah. think it's very uh, uh, good for us here to understand that because, uh, yes, uh, you know, that's uh, shy and or, uh, always changing. And we have, uh, have a very, very uh, good time with you here. So on behalf of uh, our department, uh, 
will show your gratitude to you. Thank you very much. But uh, hang on. Uh, we have here our head of department. Uh, Ms. Vivi Supratiwi, uh, do you have uh, yeah. time to talk with uh, yeah. Professor Philip Lindsley? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, hello that's... again. Uh, hello again. Nice to meet you again here. Yeah, yeah we, we met uh, a couple of months ago, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, it's great, yeah. great to see you again. Yes, yeah. Actually, uh, it was my question. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> we make question is about the, the novelty. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah because uh, we got used to, to, uh, to hear about that. <laughs> okay, then I think this is uh, all for our public lecture here. Again, uh, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Philip, for your uh, coming to uh, with us here uh, to uh, give a, a very, very good public lecture here. So as I said, that some of us, uh, our, our student here, that's uh, mm -hmm. already now, already here about uh, what you are talking about uh, today. So uh, I will give uh, 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 the audience, could we have a good applause for uh, Professor Philip Lindsley? Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much, yeah. Philip. Uh, Thank you very okay. much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. It's been okay. a Thank great you. pleasure so, being with you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank so, you. Have a good day. Have a good day. You too as well, all of you. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Then. Thank you. And before I give to the uh, Master of Ceremony, uh, how about the, the condition in uh, London now about uh, the pandemic? I heard from the news that the uh, the this race or the the new what we call it the new uh, patient the, the new uh, what we call it the new um, patient I mean the people that who have infected by uh, COVID is that yes. racing now I think is that right. Uh, the, the, the number of cases are, are really quite high in the UK at present. Um, yeah. it, it's interesting, though, I think uh, perhaps it goes back to language uh, because over the last 18 months, we've had so many statistics given to us. I think people have uh, are, are starting to accept a high level of infections as normal. So they see it as normal and that a lot of people are acting as normal. Yes. Um, you know, I, I don't go out very much, but um, when you do go out, it's noticeable that it's only a much smaller number of people now who wear face masks. Mm. I always wear a face mask, mm. but mm. Uh, and I think it's because people think, oh, well, this is just a normal thing now. Um, yeah. So we, so it's a bit it's a bit dangerous when people th start to think that you know the number of cases we have are normal yeah, because it is right. actually, it's, it's very very high. Yeah, yeah. While we are in Indonesia, it's going uh, decrease about one thousand cases in a day. I read mm -hmm. from the newspaper and I heard from uh, watching a TV that in London yeah. is about 30, 38,000, 30,000 uh, yeah, cases. Yeah, yeah, that's day. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is it's 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 very very high. That's um, right. Which is very worrying, yes. Yeah. yeah. And maybe it's that because the uh, football, is that right? I think <laughs> it might be, yeah. <laughs> it might be because of football. <laughs> okay, then uh, back to Aubrey. Uh, the time is yours, so I will give the time to you, Aubrey. Are you are still there? Yeah. Thank you, okay, Professor then. Basuki, for leading our lecture today. And I would like to say thank you to Professor Philip Linsley for, for the amazing lecture today. It does success to make me more interested in qualitative research design and method in accounting. So mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, before we end the, le the second lecture series, it's not going to be complete without taking pictures together. So I would like to ask all of you to turn on your camera. On the count of three, the crew may take the picture. Let me do the count. Okay, let's wait a minute for the participant to turn on your camera. And everybody must smile. Yes, <laughs> you can smile, of course. <laughs> I will do the count. Okay. Is everyone ready? Okay. One, 
two, and three, smile. Okay, thank you for the crew. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to kindly remind to all of the audience to fill in the feedback page and attendance form that already be uh, already given by our crew so that we can be better in our next event. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to the end of the second lecture series. I would like to apologize for any misspelling and errors made and thank you for your attention. We are dearly hoping to see you again on the next lecture series. Stay healthy and stay safe. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Good night, Philip. Good night, bye. Bye. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night.